Amen. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. Last week, we saw uh, in verses uh, 10 through 13 that we are to be strong and stand firm in the Lord against evil. We are in a war, and we should not be surprised when there is opposition. So we seem to have taken the mindset uh, in the American church in particular that spiritual growth and maturity just kind of happen, and they happen almost without any opposition. So the growing in Christ-likeness can somehow be done either passively or without any significant challenges along the way. A friend of mine, Brian Croft, made an important observation a few years ago that he shared with me, and it encouraged me in a difficult time. He quoted 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 8 to 9, which says, But I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost, for a wide door for effective ministry has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. His point was, whenever the gospel is proclaimed, Clearly, whenever the Bible is believed and held to unapologetically, whenever we are actively pursuing Christ's likeness and sanctification, there will be adversaries and there will be opposition. And the opposition comes because we are on the right track, not because we are off track. In other words, Satan is going to oppose those who are actively, zealously, pursuing God. He will not interrupt us if we are not doing that. It's a quote that's attributed to Napoleon Bonaparte, which says, never interrupt an enemy when he is in the process of destroying himself. And so there will be opposition, there will be adversaries if we are following Christ. And we see that Paul elaborates on how we are to be strengthened in the Lord and how we are to take a stand in the strength of his might. And we are not passive in this. In fact, the activity that we are to do as you go through these verses is we are to put on. We are to put on. Which means... That far from being passive, we are actively pursuing this rather than sitting back expecting it to happen on his own. Just It seems silly, but just think for a moment. You wake up and you just expect your clothes to jump on you. You just expect yourself to be dressed without any putting on of the clothes. That's kind of the picture, the imagery that Paul is giving us here. Another way to say it is that God has ordained means by which he strengthens us and by which we stand against evil. And our job is to actively pursue those means that he has ordained in faith. And the way Paul describes this, the way Paul articulates these means is in terms of pieces of armor that we are to actively put on and dress ourselves in. And just, therefore, if we are to stand and be strong, we have to be equipped to do that. So this morning, I'm going to be particularly focused on these various elements in the context of putting them on. This sermon and next sermon are kind of like parts one and two. And they're more admonishment and pleading with all of us than anything else. If we are to stand and be strong, we must equip ourselves with these fundamental tenets of what it means to be a Christian. Like, here's, here's the, one of the things that I really struggle with is we think that we want to be doing Christianity 501 when we haven't cr- mastered Christianity 101. Right? We think we outgrow these fundamental basics. We've talked about this before, like when you play a sport, What's the big thing that that a good coach is going to keep drawing you back to? It's going to be the fundamentals, right? It's going to be the things that you learned in Little League because baseball, right? I don't know what they – peewee football? I don't know what football is called when you're a little kid. Um, I played 
baseball. So we'll just run with that. Uh, in Little League, you learn these basic fundamental elements of how to play a game. You learn how to catch a ball. You learn how to field a ground ball. You learn how to swing a bat. You learn how to throw a ball. You learn how to catch a fly ball. Like, listen, they don't change. The guys that are playing in the show at the MLB are doing the exact same things that the, that the, that the uh, elementary school kids are doing in Little League. They've just done it over and over and over and over and over and over, and they've mastered it to such a level that they're able to do it at that caliber to play Major League Baseball. Right? They're, they're not, it's not like you get to the minors and they teach you a new set of rules or a new way to play. You play the same way you've always played. You're just proficient at it. Listen, I'm going to take all the mystery out of what it means to follow Jesus. It's being proficient at a few simple ordinary things and getting better at them. That's what it is to, to follow Jesus. And, and we overcomplicate this thing so much. And so I love how Paul just brings us right back to the fundamentals. He brings us right back to the basics. He says, if you are going to be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might, and if you're going to stand, you have to be committed to a few basic fundamental things and put them on every single day. The church must live in these. The church must breathe these. We must put these on. And so often the conversation goes to, well, what about this and what about this and what about this? And all I'm asking this morning is, are we doing these things? Are we focusing on these things? Because these are the things that Paul highlights that will strengthen us and allow us to stand. Seems maybe a little bit important then may be worth our attention and our time and our effort. And, and not, not the arrogance of thinking that we outgrow these, but a humility that brings us back to assessing how we're doing in these things. And so that's kind of the goal for the next two weeks, is I just want to admonish us, I want to encourage us, I want to plead with us to go back to these things. And if you notice, this really kind of covered, covers the gamut. Paul aptly uses the analogy of armor and ties these different pieces of armor to different means that God uses to equip us, strengthen us, keep us, fortify us against attack. And our role is to renew our minds and to think on these things and to believe and apply them in our lives. <clears throat> and so... I'm asking us for a while to go back to the basics, to go back to the fundamentals, to think back to these ordinary things that God has ordained and ask some hard questions about them in our own lives. So with that, this is the word of the Lord from Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 to 17. Stand therefore, sorry, 14 to 17. Stand therefore, having fastened the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you will extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. This is the word the Lord has for us this morning, and it is eternally true. There's a few points this morning. If you're keeping track, <clears throat> the first one is just simply this. God is a warrior. And this might, not, this might seem a little bit obscure, given the fact that all of this is talking about armor that we're supposed to put on. But right off the bat, we begin to see what it means to be strengthened in the Lord and the strength of his might in terms of putting on armor that he strengthens us with to stand against evil. And what's interesting and fascinating is <clears throat> if you go to Isaiah chapter 59, verses 16 and 17, we read this. He saw that there was no man and wondered what there was, uh, that he, and wondered that there was no one to intercede. Then his own arm brought him salvation and his righteousness upheld him. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. 
He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. So it seems that Paul, at least in the back of his mind, is drawing from some of this Old Testament imagery from Isaiah and other places where this type of language is applied to the Lord. God is pictured as a warrior on behalf of his people. And this is really, really important. Don't don't miss this. Okay, This is really important. I hope you'll see why in just a minute. That is how we can be confident that we will be strengthened with his strength and be able to stand because we don't stand alone. We are not relying on our own strength. We have one who fights for us. When the people of Israel were brought out of Egypt and were being pursued by Pharaoh in Exodus 14, the people were told, the Lord will fight for you. You need only be silent. In Exodus 15.3, we read, the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name. In Deuteronomy 1.30, the Lord, your God, who goes forth before you, will fight for you just as you saw him do for you in Egypt. In Joshua chapter 23, Say, you have seen everything that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake because it was the Lord your God who fought for you. Now, just think about that for a moment. Joshua, at the end of his life, is being encouraged because he is to see that it was God who won the victories for them but what are, what, what's the Israelite army doing, right? The, the children in Sunday school this morning are learning about the fall of Jericho. They were not passive. They weren't just sitting there being like, okay, Lord, whenever you, you want to knock these walls down, there were actually means that God ordained and they had to step out and obey. They had to go and walk around the city seven times. Right now, imagine you're an Israelite. Now, you might be thinking, what in the world are we doing? Like, you serious right now? You want, okay, you just want to take the ark. You want us to parade around behind the ark, and we're going to walk around the city, and we're going to go home. That's the plan. Yes. And we're going to do it again? Yes. We're going to do it again. And now, all right, so today is the day the walls come down, and the way that that's going to happen is we're just going to blow a bunch of horns? Yes. Do you see how the Israelites were active, but the Israelites weren't the ones whose power brought down the walls? And and God is reminding Joshua of that. uh, Everything that the Lord your God has done to all these nations for your sake, because it was the Lord your God who fought for you. In Romans chapter 12, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. The Lord fights for you, so that means you don't need to take vengeance because he's going to right all the wrongs. He's going to undo all of the damage. He's going to make everything right one day. In Isaiah 42, the Lord goes out like a mighty man, like a man of war. He stirs up zeal. He cries out. He shouts aloud. He shows himself mighty against his foes. In Psalm 24, 8, who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. And so on, and so on, and so on. And so, here's the upshot of that. We can confess with Jeremiah chapter 20, but the Lord is with me as a dread warrior. Therefore, my persecutors will stumble. They will not overcome me. They will be greatly shamed, for they will not succeed. Their eternal dishonor shall never be forgotten. Now, what's the fundamental basis for that? The Lord is with me. The Lord fights for me. The Lord upholds me. The Lord is with me as a dread warrior. And the point is this. If you are in Christ, God is 100% for you. And if you are in Christ, you never stand alone in your own strength. You never have to do battle on your own. You are never left to your own devices because God is a warrior for his people. And he is a strong and mighty warrior. God is not standing by idly watching. He is actively involved in the lives of his people and is ruthlessly for them. 
and for their good. He protects us. He defends us. He upholds us. He sustains us. He preserves us. And no matter what you go through in life, no matter what temptations you face, if you are in Christ, you never, ever face them alone. Now, admittedly, many of us might respond, well, I don't really feel like he's with me and fighting for me. I want you to hold that thought as we consider the means by which God strengthens us. And the first one is truth. Look at verse 14. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand the evil day. Verse 13 and then 14. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Charles Hodge says it means truth subjectively considered, that is, the knowledge and belief of the truth. This is the first and indispensable qualification for a Christian soldier. To enter on the spiritual conflict, ignorant or doubting, would be to enter the battle blind and lame. As the girdle gives strength and freedom of action and therefore confidence, so does the truth when spiritually apprehended and believed. Let not anyone imagine that he is prepared to withstand the assaults of the power of darkness if his, mind, if his mind is stored with his own theories or with the speculations of other men. I'm going to read that last sentence again. Let not anyone imagine that he is prepared to withstand the assaults of the powers of darkness if his mind is stored with his own theories or with the speculations of men. Nothing but the truth of God, clearly understood and cordially embraced, will enable him to keep his feet for a moment before these celestial potentates. Truth has been a central theme in this letter so far. In chapter 1, verse 13, the the message of truth that is the gospel of your salvation. In chapter 4, verse 15, we're to speak truth in love in verse or chapter 4 verse 21 uh, 21 just as truth is in Jesus in chapter 4 verse 24 put on the new self which is in the likeness of God and has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth in chapter 4 verse 25 therefore laying aside falsehood speak to the truth each of you to his neighbor chapter 5 verse 9 for the fruit of light consists in all goodly, uh, goodness righteousness and truth. It's just amazing how often truth comes up in this letter. Truth finds its incarnation in the gospel and in Christ. Christ is the truth. Truth is the same, is unchanging, is relevant in any culture, in any location, and in any moment in history. Now, come back to the, to the way we ended that, that first point with the God as, God as a warrior. And, and some of us might be sitting here saying, well, I don't really feel like he is with me or fighting for me. Listen to what H.B. Charles Jr. said. Truth is truth whether I experience it or not. The Lord does not need my experience to validate his word. So we are to stand fast having put on truth. I think there's two major ways that this applies to us in particular this morning. We must seek truth and we must live in light of truth. So we live in an age where truth is thought to be subjective, where the idea of objective truth is not only rejected but offensive. And yet truth is one of the primary means by which we are sanctified and made more to be like Christ. In John 17, Jesus said, sanctify them in the truth Your word is truth. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Which means that we must seek out the truth of the Bible if we are to be conformed to the image of Christ. We must conform our lives around the Bible and not try to conform the Bible around what we want to be true or wish were true. Truth is a north star. And in the context of Ephesians 6... In spiritual warfare, we're fighting against an enemy who is the father of lies. 
Don't miss that. The devil is the father of lies. For there to be a father of lies, and for there to be lies, there must be truth that the lies stand opposed to. And one of the greatest victories that Satan has won in the church is this tepid fear of actually standing somewhere on something and saying this is true. And we've embraced the lie that maybe it's your truth but not my truth or maybe we can have these two competing things to be true. Like I love... uh, uh, a long time ago, um, there was a Christian apologist that was meeting with this, uh, this, this guy who was an uh, Eastern mystic. And he was like, the problem with you Westerners is you only think in either or. We think in both and. So you say either this is true or this is true. The law of non-contradiction, right? A and B cannot be simultaneously true if they are opposed to one another. And he goes, we don't think like that in the East. We think it can be A and B. And he went on to explain why he was right and why it had to be both and it couldn't be either or. Catch the irony there? And this guy, after listening to him for a while, said, so what you're saying is it can't be both and and either or. It must be either both and or and or. And this Eastern mystic guy goes, yes, that does seem to come up quite a bit, doesn't it? Right? The, one of the biggest victories that Satan has won is, is the cowardice of Christians when it comes to standing and proclaiming and boldly standing on the grounds of truth. He is the father of lies. The devil is the father of lies. And so spiritual warfare is first and foremost a battle for the truth. And God has spoken. That's the fundamental issue here. God has spoken. He has revealed truth. He has given his truth and preserved his word. And we are to speak the truth in love. As a side note, this is why slander and gossip and false witness are so pernicious. As Christians, we are committed to be We are to be committed to speaking the truth in love, having been formed by the truth, living in light of the truth, loving the truth, hating lies. And isn't it ironic that one of the most acceptable sins in the church and large gossip and slander and false witness are really from the father of lies? We must love truth and hate lies. We must fight for the truth. We must stand on the truth. We must defend the truth. We must not back down from the truth because insofar as we are conforming ourselves to the truth of God's word, truth is on our side. So Paul admonished us in Philippians 4, 8, whatever is true, think on these things. In Romans 12, we're not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In John 8, the truth sets us free. We are to worship in spirit and truth. In John chapter 4, pastors are rightly to divide the word of truth. In 2 Timothy 2, we are not to, uh, we are to love not just the word, or not, I'm sorry, we are to love not just in word and talk, but in deed and truth. In 1 John, the Lord is near to all who call upon him in truth. In Psalm 145, love rejoices in the truth. In 1 Corinthians 13, every word of God proves to be true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. In Proverbs 30, the truth is a big deal. It is the first thing that Paul says to put on if you are to stand and be strengthened by the Lord. And the father of lives wants you to say, well, that's not true. What does he do? All the time, did God really say? Did God really say? He's been playing, running that play since the beginning. And so if we are to be strengthened to stand against evil, it will only be in the truth. So put on truth. Seek out truth. Pursue it diligently. Like, I'm not talking about pursue it like, like Google and read the first two hits that come up and be like, oh, well, there you go. That's it. Right? The, so that passes for seeking truth for a lot of people today. I'm talking about like actually diligently digging in and finding out for yourself, opening God's word, looking at it, studying it, examining it. There are no shortcuts. 
There's no easy path to this. You don't get the cliff notes, right? It's cliff notes, right? Where it summarizes a, a summarizes, a, yeah. You don't get to use that, right? You actually have to dig in yourself. And then we have to build our lives around it. We have to live in a way that doesn't live by lies or contribute to lies. We are to speak the truth, even if it is unpopular. We are to believe the truth, even if we will be mocked for it. We are to stand for the truth, even if we stand alone. I think this deals with both doctrine and integrity. Because if you're being formed by right doctrine, what's going to be created is right integrity and right character that's going to be formed after the image of Christ. Sinclair Ferguson said of this verse, in other words, the doctrine has to be worked right down to our bones so that it becomes part of us and if affect, and it affects everything that we are and that we do so that we are people of truth and integrity and then we will be able to resist the devil on the evil day. <clears throat> and there are many today that want nothing to do with doctrine and don't want to take a stand for truth because they say it is offensive and it divides. Well, I will agree with the last part of that sentence. It is offensive and it does divide. And the question is, is that a bad thing? Listen to what Martin Luther said. Peace if possible, truth at all costs. Believers are to be people of truth. So put on truth to be strengthened to stand against evil. The second thing Paul brings up is righteousness. He talks about the breastplate of righteousness. If we want to be strengthened to stand against evil, we must pursue holiness and Christ-likeness. Now, commentators kind of like go back and forth of whether this is talking about God's righteousness provided for us in Christ or whether this is the righteousness of God worked out in how we live our lives and are conformed to the image of Christ. And in some sense, I really don't think it matters because we're creating a distinction that the Bible never never gets to, right? Like So like the righteousness credited to us by faith, Christ's righteousness given to us, is distinct from practical righteousness in our lives, right? But they're not divorced from one another. You can't have the practical righteousness or the, the positional righteousness of Christ credited to you by faith and not have it affect how we live. That is what, what, what James says when he says, faith without works is dead, right? You show me your faith apart from works, I'll show you my faith by my works. In other words, the righteousness of Christ, credited to, credited to us by faith, by which we are justified, counted righteous, made right with God. That is an objective reality that we receive by faith. What does Paul say in Ephesians chapter 2, right? He goes on like you're dead, but God made you alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's a gift from God, right? That's justification. That is God objectively on the merits of Christ giving us his righteousness by faith, taking our sin and placing it upon him so that we might stand before him accepted, perfect, holy, as if we had never sinned. But what's the next verse in chapter 2? For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, that he prepared beforehand that we should walk in, which means that the objective reality of being given Christ's righteousness means that we live in a transformed way that reflects that, that grows in, in, in reflecting that. You cannot take away the practical, lived-out holiness that we are to pursue from the objective given righteousness that we receive. Those two go hand in hand. And Satan would love for you to focus on the objective righteousness credited to you by faith and utterly ignore the holiness without which one will not see the Lord in Hebrews. 
He wants you to think that the way you live doesn't really matter and is inconsequential. Or he wants you to think that the way you live is the only way that you'll be accepted before God, and both are wrong. We're accepted before God on the merits of Christ alone. And at the same time, when we're transformed inwardly by the work of Christ, credited to us by faith, when the gospel takes root, it's going to work itself out in practical, real-life ways in which we're growing to become more like Christ. In Galatians 4.19, Paul said that he labors for believers until Christ is formed in them. In Ephesians 4, we are to grow up to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. I don't think he means just like realizing what's been given to us. I think he's talking about very practical things because all of chapters 3 through 6 are practical, everyday life-changing or life um, application type things that flow from the first three chapters of what's been done for us. In 3 John 1, 4, there is no greater joy for John than to know that the people are walking in the truth, walking in the truth, living out the truth. In fact, through speaking in truth and love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ in Ephesians chapter 4, which means that how we live matters. The truth must impact our lives to where we become more and more reflectors of the character of God. We are to put off the old man and put on the new one, which is being renewed in the image of its creator in Colossians chapter 3. And much of modern evangelicalism is indifferent toward personal holiness because we've been taught to view that as legalism. And it's not. And that's one of the things that Satan would love for us to believe. The righteousness that is given to us by Christ through faith has real world impact and touches our lives in everyday practical ways as we grow in living that out. And we are to walk in obedience to the Lord who transformed our hearts. We are to love him and desire to honor him and reflect his character. And so the question is, if you're going to stand and you're going to be strengthened by the Lord, are you serious about how you live your life? So does the truth then impact how you live? Believers are to be living lives that aim to reflect the righteousness of God, so put on righteousness to stand against evil. Thirdly, the gospel of peace. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. What kind of peace? Well, first of all, the gospel accomplishes peace between us and God, right? Christ died for sinners so that we might be reconciled to God, so that we might be with him forever. The whole point of Jesus coming and living a perfect life and dying on a cross and raising from the dead and coming back is so that where he is, we might be also. So that God might be our God and we might be his people. So that we we might live in the eternal presence of God without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, being totally sanctified and made holy by the sacrifice of Christ credited to us. That is what the gospel does. The gospel, first and foremost, brings peace with God. In Romans chapter 5, which Ben preached a while back, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. And Satan wants you to think that you are constantly trying to achieve that peace. Satan wants you to think that that peace is always in peril. That you are one screw up away from God rejecting you and throwing you away and wanting nothing to do with you that you don't really have peace, right? He wants you to think of that peace as like peace in the Middle East that maybe lasts for a few years, but anything can set that off. And yet the gospel tells us that peace with God has been objectively, definitively, indefinitely secured by Christ. That what he did really does accomplish what he said 
it would. The gospel fights against spiritual despair and spiritual warfare that Satan would wage against you by giving you an absolute 100% confidence that you have peace with God. All that is necessary to bring us into right relationship with God, to secure our adoption, to give us redemption, the forgiveness of our trespasses in chapter 1, which has been lavished upon us in Christ, has been objectively done. You can only be strengthened to stand if you are at peace with God. Right? We're not fighting a war on two fronts. We're not fighting against God and against Satan. That's, that doesn't exist. You're on one side or the other. And the gospel tells us, no, you're on God's side and he's on your side. And that peace has been accomplished, so turn and fight the real enemy. And Satan wants you to doubt that peace. And so all of this, if we're going to fight, if we're going to stand, if we're going to be strengthened, it has to keep going back to the gospel. It has to keep going back to the cross of Christ and what was accomplished. Back to the resurrection where that was affirmed by God to be accepted and true. Back to the return of Christ where he will ultimately bring these realities before our eyes and we might enjoy them and live in them for the rest of eternity. This is what we proclaim every single time we take the Lord's Supper. We have peace with God on the merits of Christ through the gospel. But we also have the peace of God. In John 14, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts in Colossians chapter 3. We have to take our anxieties and worries and cares to God in faith that the peace of Christ which surpasses all understanding will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. In the world you will have trouble. Take heart. I have overcome the world in John 16, 33. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Spirit you may abound in hope in Romans chapter 5. We have the peace of God. So we're, we have peace with God and then we have peace from God. All because of the gospel. But then that works out into our relationships with other believers. We have peace with God, we have peace from God, and that translates into peace with one another. Division and dissension are works of the flesh and fruit of the adversary. The gospel gives us peace with God and peace with one another. So whenever there is petty division in the church, wherever there is gossip, wherever there is slander, wherever there is malice, wherever there is contention, wherever there is pointless arguments, wherever there are selfish opinions that cause bitterness and dissension, wherever there are people that are marked by the works of the flesh, by divisions, by dissensions, by cantankerous spirits and attitudes, and by, um, uh, by bitterness... You can be sure who's behind it. 100%. And at the same time, you can be 100% sure that the gospel addresses it. In Ephesians chapter 4, we should be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. In chapter 2, He himself is our peace who made us both one and broke down the dividing wall of hostility, creating one new man in the place of the two, so making peace. So there's peace with God, peace from God, peace with one another, and then there's a proclamation of that peace if we go out and preach the gospel. They're telling of others that are not at peace with God how they can have peace with God. 2 Corinthians 5.20, we appeal to people to be reconciled to God. They too can have that peace. They too can enjoy the blessed contentment of no longer striving for God's acceptance or dreading his frown, but only being met with his fatherly smile through Christ Jesus, and Satan hates that. So if we're to stand strengthened against evil, it's only standing with the gospel that brings peace, the gospel that accomplishes peace. Believers have peace because of what has been done for us, in other words. And that strengthens us to stand. He goes to say, 
having the shield of faith. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which we can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. <clears throat> and all of this that we've talked about so far is great, and we can mentally ascend to it and never actually truly believe it. And so there is this implication that we would all cry out, I believe, help my unbelief. If our f so our faith is only as strong as the object of our faith. And if our faith is to grow, the object of our faith must grow. You will only sit on the chair that you actually trust. Right? You will only get on the plane if you actually trust that the ground crew and the engineer and the, the uh, people that assembled the plane and the pilots that are flying the plane and everybody else, the air control town, everybody knows what they're doing. And so there's a connection between faith and action because as the youth looked at in James, even demons believe. Fight, Satan is fighting against your faith. And he's fighting against your faith as one who affirms certain truths about God, but those truths aren't anything beyond merely acknowledgement of realities. There is a belief that is present in the church that some call faith that is no better than the belief of demons. True faith trusts God and entrusts ourselves to God. True faith takes truth and then lives in light of it. We talked about this in Sunday school with the Spirit, but with the way that we live as Christians in America, does it actually really require faith? I mean, think about ordinary things. How much of our lives is actually an exercise of faith and how much of our lives can be lived without really requiring any step out in faith? How many of us are content with faith as a therapeutic act exercise or faith that, that comes to soothe certain things when things get rough, but we never really are willing to step out into what God has called us to, not knowing how it's going to turn out, trusting him to handle all of that. Faith is acting in light of truth believe. Faith says your will be done on earth as it is in heaven and then steps out in trust to live that way. And so much of what we see around us is man's clever ideas and man's witty, uh, witty solutions rather than faith in God's word to the degree that we order our lives and our worship and our church and our families according to the Bible. And so often when we're faced with adversity, our immediate impulse is to try to manage the situation in our own wisdom. Our reflex is to deal with it ourselves, not exercise faith. And Paul is saying if you're to be strengthened and you're to stand, the only way you stand, the only way you quench those those fiery darts of the adversary is by standing behind faith, like getting behind faith. Faith does the opposite of say, I've got this, I know how to handle this. Faith puts confidence in God and not the flesh, in his ability, not our abilities. Faith diligently seeks out direction from God's word and then acts in light of that, trusting him in the process rather than coming up with our own clever solutions. And Satan is constantly wanting you to either not believe or to believe wrongly. He wants you to doubt God's word, doubt his promises, doubt his sovereignty, doubt his goodness, doubt his character, doubt his wisdom, doubt his power, or he wants you to believe totally wrongly about them in a way that distorts God to be a creation of your own imagination. And so if you're to stand strong against the Lord, the Faith must be at the heart of it because fear, because faith addresses doubt and overcomes fear. In Psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Faith gives calm confidence in the face of uncertainty and opposition because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And we actually trust that and believe that and live in light of that. Polycarp, bishop of Ephesus, was being prepared to be burned alive by his Roman captors, and they said to him, where's your hope now? Do you not want to call out for mercy from Caesar and the gods rather than die this horrible death? And here's how Polycarp responded. 84 years I have served Christ, and he has never done me wrong. Am I to begin not trusting him now? And he died right there on that pyre. Listen, we can all look back in our lives and we can see where God has been faithful, where God has been consistent, where God has upheld his promises and proven himself over and over and over and over and over. And the question just keeps getting asked. This is this fundamental question of faith. Do you trust God? Do you really, truly trust God? God. And if so, it's going to show up in how we live. We're going to say, I trust you, even though I don't understand this. I have a track record back here I can look back to. I have your word that promises it, and that's good enough for me because you said it, and you're faithful. In every circumstance, in every situation, if God is for you, who can be against you? The exercise of faith is a conduit through which God strengthens us to stand against evil. Believers are to live by faith. The just shall live by faith. So we'll stop there. And next week we'll pick back up and we'll look at the last three. But I just want to Like, these are the fundamentals, right? These are the basics. This is how God fights for us. By taking up these means and putting them on. So the question is very simple this morning. The application is very simple. Are you putting on these things? Are you putting on truth? Are you putting on Righteousness, both Christ's righteousness credited to us and our pursuit of practical holiness and Christ likeness in our lives. Are we putting on the gospel of peace and pursuing the peace that the gospel brings and pursuing the peace by the means of the gospel? Are we taking up and putting on the shield of faith that can extinguish? all of the flaming darts of the evil one and trusting God to be true, though everyone else be a liar? Very fundamental, basic questions, but questions that we should seriously consider and ponder and ask ourselves if we are to stand strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might against evil. Let's pray.